the God that created the some 200 billion galaxies, trillions, each of those have billions of stars, each of those 200 billion galaxies and billions of stars. And he created this with his words. And then he made us and formed us with some 37 trillion cells. But then when you think about this God who set the stars in in space is knowable. Personally knowable. Not what you read in a book and find some information. You can have a relationship with this God. In fact, that's why he came. That's why he created man. That's why he knew him in the garden and walked with him and talked with him and communed with him. And until sin broke the fellowship, it was all about God and man getting to know each other. And sin broke that. And Jesus has been, or God has been on a course since that time to get man and God back together again. Because he loves you so much. And there's nothing God wants to do more. God, he had the stars. He's got the galaxies by the billions. But he wants you. That's why he created man. He named all the stars. But he don't have a relationship with those. He breathed in man and they became a living soul. Why a soul? Because they have mind and will and emotions and they can relate. And that was his design. For thy pleasure, they are created. The world is created. So I want to talk again about knowing God today. My, my printer actually broke, so I'm not used to having my computer up here. But we will try it. We will try. Well, I just seem like real high tech, don't I, man? I do, man. This is real high tech, man. This is a, Lord help it work. What I do, what I do. No, okay. You know, it's bad when your computer don't recognize you. You know, you're getting old quick. When you got to take a re-picture every week. No, okay. <laughs> That's bad, David. My computer didn't know me, so I had to retake a picture. What's called getting old by the day. <laughs> Hallelujah. Knowing God. We talked about the importance of knowing God and the blessings. And when I talk about knowing God, listen, I'm talking about you ascertain. I love that word, but look at the word ascertain. What does it have in it? As certain. I'm talking about knowing God as a certainty. Not as something, well, I think, yes, some people, well, I I think, if you hesitate, you don't know him like he wants you to. If you got to think about it, there's some doubt there. Ascertain. By seeing, not by reading, not by just hearing a story. But how many of you know, said, you've been told something and you said, it just kind of clicked. Oh, I see that. A seeing is an understanding. It's a revelation. I I see what you're saying is, I comprehend that. Just to think with me a moment that we can comprehend God to a degree. I don't think we can know him now, he's just too great for that. But he reveals himself to us as we can comprehend, as we can understand. And then one of these days, let me say one of these days, we'll stand before God and the Bible says we will see him. Hello. See him. See him. That means we're going to know him in his fullness. Heaven ain't just about streets of gold. Thank God they're they're there. Heaven is about seeing God and understanding Him in everything, in all of His glory, in all of His nature, in all of His goodness. Paul said it this way, I count everything. Everybody say everything. Everything, everything, everything as lost. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake. Not for Paul's sake. What you do for God is not for 
your sake. It's for the glory of God. Thank God he blesses us. Thank God it's reciprocal. Thank God he, he, he blesses his children. That's just what a father does. I, I, nothing much I love more than being a father except being a husband. I guess I better say that if I want to eat lunch, you know. <clears throat> and a grandpa. For the sake, his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I may win Christ. Nothing compares to this impo- the importance of knowing God. I don't know what you put before knowing God, but I'm going to submit to you. Nothing's worth sacrificing at the expense of knowing God. No money, no possessions. And many people do. They, they live this life and at the expense of not knowing God. Because they're so wrapped up in accumulating and getting rich and, and getting wealth. And, and those things are not evil and sinful by themselves. But if you do that at the expense of knowing God, ooh, you're going to miss out. You're going to miss nothing. Is as wonderful as knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Nothing compares to the greatness of knowing. Nothing. Can you think of anything? How much money would it take to satisfy you and say, okay, I'm going to take this and I don't need to know God anymore? What job would it be? What is it in your life, if anything, that would say, okay, This is more valuable than knowing God. That sounds foolish to me. To take anything at the expense. Now the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 29, to boast, let him that boasts, boast in this, that they know me. Let not the rich man boast. They didn't say riches are evil. In fact, Paul, it, it plainly teaches, it just says let the rich man be generous in giving and not hoarding and not greed. God's not against riches. God's against covetousness and greediness. But let the rich man, don't boast in his riches. Don't let the wise man boast in his wisdom. But let him that boasts, boast in this, that he knows me. I don't care how much money you got. It doesn't compare with knowing God. It doesn't compare with knowing God. The blessings of knowing God. We talked about them, and I don't want to, there's that scripture review too much. But here's what we talked about last week. Just knowing God. Now, we can stop right there. What's the blessing of knowing God? Knowing God. Everything else is just like icing on the cake. Woo! That's being like being married to Elizabeth. Everything else is just... I sit on the cake. Y'all know I'm in the doghouse, or I wouldn't be saying these things. <laughs> no, not really. But I'm going to be if I don't shut up. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about how to know God. How to know God. First, you've got to know it's possible. We've talked about that. That just God wants to know you. Wants you to know him. He wants to know you. He wants to have a relationship with you. People don't really understand that. People, many people, Christian people, still have this idea that God is just an object up there and he's really not wanting to know me. And I, every once in a while I do something religious uh, because we're supposed to do that and it's not a relationship. And that's true for many Christians. It's not an intimacy. It's not a relationship. It's not getting to know him. It's just I know about God, and I go to church occasionally, and I read my Bible occasionally. I say a prayer every once in a while, and, and that's not knowing God. That is not knowing God. We can know about God and never know God. you got to know it's possible. That this God who created all things and, and by whom all things consist. He's holding it all together. Woo! Woo! 
He's my daddy. He's my father. He loves me. He cares for me. I can cast all my care upon him because this God that made the 200 billion galaxy cares for Randy Siebert. You know, when you know God in, in the measure, that's why you can trust him. Why is it important to know him? Because you'll trust him once you get to know him a little bit. And you'll learn his faithfulness. you learn his character. you learn his glory. you learn his nature. And then you begin to say, hey, I can cast. I can, he'll take care of that. I can trust that to him because I know him. And I know his character. And I know what he's able to do. We were created for his pleasure. I mentioned that. Uh, John 15, 15. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. But I call you friends because the friends know the plans and the motives and the heart and the mind of the master. And so you can kind of tell what level of intimacy you're on with with how much you know about the plans and the mind of God. Because if you know him, he's sharing that with you. See, this is what I have for you. This is what I want. You see the relationship. Of, I don't call you slaves because a slave does not know. He, the master's not confiding in the slave. The master's confiding in the friends. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. This is how much I love you. And this is, let me tell you what I've got for you. I know the plans. We know Jeremiah 29, 11, that I have for you. How do you know him? Because you're his friend. And you can know what he has in store with you. You never have to doubt. Listen to me. You remember Matthew chapter 25. Where the, uh, the disciples came and said, man, we've cast out demons in your name. We've done mighty miracles in your name. We've prophesied in your name. And the sad words of our Lord said, I never knew you. You can not only can know God, but it's God's desire. I'm going to tell you this. He wants to know you more than he wants you to do for him. These cast out demons. These did, these did some mighty, listen to me. I mean, these, these did some powerful things. But that's not what got them entrance into, what is it? It's their relationship. They say relationship. The relationship with God is what he said, hey. Come unto me. Enter in. Why? Because I knew you. Yes, you can know him. And yes, it is the greatest desire of God for you to know him. And if you ever think he doesn't want to know you, this cries out. I want to know you. The God that forsook his son. He wants to know you. Do not waste your life. And I believe a life is wasted if you live it and not know the God who gave it. Success is not in your job. Success is not in your bank account. God help us. Don't be deceived. Success is in knowing God and doing His will. If you ever doubt, does God really care? Does God really know me? Boy, that right there shouts out. I love you! And I'm willing to go to the cross and die this horrific death because I want a relationship with you. It starts with surrender. Ugh. I should go talk all night and not talk about that. But it begins with, hey, I want to be a Christ follower. Follower like Gracie said. Like many of you have said. That's what becoming a Christian is. It's not voicing some words. Becoming a Christian is I want to follow Jesus. What's it mean to follow him? 
go where he goes and do what he does and say what he says. We've made it a little difficult, I think. We've religionized it, if you will. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I learn about him, a, dis a, a disciple, a learner. I learn the ways of God, and I follow the ways of God. That's a Christian, and I'm becoming more like him as I do. If any of you want to be my follower, Matthew 16, 24, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. That's denial. Luke 14, in the same way, none of you can be my disciple unless you give up everything. Don't you love the gospel? <laughs> Woo! If you lay ownership of anything, the Bible says you can't be a follower of me. I'm glad I, Randy Siebert didn't say that. I'm, let me read it one more time so you'll know. Luke 14, 33, in the same way, none of you, everybody say none. Everybody say, that's me. Can't be my disciple unless you give up everything. Mm. We need to hear the gospel. What does it mean to give up? To forsake, to renounce. I did a wedding last night. Told both of them, forsaking all others. What does that mean? This is my first love. Matt was his name. Cassidy was her name. Cassidy, you going to forsake everybody? All others? Okay, then, I'll marry you. Matt? Are you going to forsake all the other ladies in your life? Okay, then, you can get married. Are you ready to forsake all others in your life? Okay, then, Jesus said you can follow me. Mm. He makes demands on our life, doesn't he? He made demands to the rich young ruler. He made demands to everybody. He said, deny yourself, forsake. It literally means say adios. And so it means say, everything I've got, everything I am, I'm yours, Lord. I surrender. My house is yours. My car is yours. My you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you got to sell everything. It means to renounce it. Renounce ownership. Because he's your Lord. That means owner and controller. Surrender is also confessing our sin. Psalms 25, verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. The secret of the Lord. I want to know the heart of God. I want to know the mind of Christ, the secrets of the Lord. That's why he said, I call you friend. I'm going to confide in you. I'm going to tell you some things. I'm going to get real personal with you. That's what he does to his followers. Sin destroys fellowship. That's why surrender involves repentance. It involves confessing our sin and turning to God and asking forgiveness. God hates sin. Why does he hate it so much? Because it destroys fellowship with those whom he loves so much. We got friends, and if you get offended with each other, guess what? It breaks fellowship. If I do something to you and I offend you, or vice versa, or we offend a friend, you don't have the communication. You don't have that relationship. There's a break there. And God says, confess your sin. I don't want to break. I want you to come to me. I want to forgive you. I want to restore you. I want to love you. Confess your sin, and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want a fellowship with you. So if there's sin in your life, unconfessed sin in your life, you can't have that unbroken fellowship with God. If you could, he would not need to have shed his blood for forgiveness. But thank God for the provision. Amen. I believe 1 John 1, 9 was written to believers. If you confess your sin, yes, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So if you're going to know God, you've got to surrender to God. You've got to forsake all you have. You've got to renounce ownership of it. Give it to God. Don't lay claim on it. 
and you got to have all sin in your life that is confessed. Sounds like obedience, doesn't it? Obedience produces friendship. John 15, verse 10. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. John 15, 12. This is my commandment that you love each other the same way that I have loved you. Verse 13. John 15. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. And verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command. I'll confide in you if you follow me. I'll confide in you if you obey me. When you sin, when you disobey, when you rebel, there's a break there. You lose the fellowship with God. That's why confessing of our sin. That's why you need to take sin in your life very seriously. Can I preach against sin for just a moment? Thank you. I'm going to anyway. Just thought it would be polite and ask. <laughs> if sin's ever flipping in your life, God's not confiding in you. And so we, we all sin. Can we, can we settle that right now? Your pastor sins. That may be a surprise to you. <laughs> Everybody says, nope. <laughs> and Greg said, I ain't surprised to me. I've been over to your house. No. Tanner says, no, I've lived with him. I know that. I mean, I've lived with him. I mean, help me, Lord. <laughs> Tanner stayed with us for several months, so let me clarify that right quick. Thank you, yes. Where was I before I embarrassed myself? Sin, 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 sin. hey, sin. Sin, sin. <laughs> Woo, help me, Jesus. You're my friend. <laughs> Our attitude about sin, that's where I was. If sin is ever just kind of flippant, and you kind of do it, uh, God understands, God cares, you're on dangerous ground. You're on dangerous ground. You open, you're so vulnerable to the enemy, and you're losing that fellowship, and if you don't change it, you're going to be far from God. It's just a matter of time. And it can happen to any of us. While the Bible says, let him that thinks he stand, take heed, lest he fall. God guard my mouth. Put a guard over my mouth, over my heart, that I might not sin again. Every one of us are prone to. Every one of us are possible to. But it's the attitude about it that really makes the difference. What's the difference between, it's not a hypocrite. If you're a Christian today and you sin, that does not make you a hypocrite. If you're a Christian today and you sin and you don't confess it, you act like you ain't, you're a hypocrite. It's not a hypocrite to sin and ask forgiveness. It's called a human being. But it's a hypocrite to sin and deny it and act like, like you ain't sin. God has some very uh, <clears throat> not nice words for hypocrites. But those who freely confess, he has some very sweet words. I cleanse you. So why would anybody want to hang on to sin? And not break that fellowship. He is faithful. Everybody say faithful. And just to confess our sin and cleanse us. You can stay clean before God. Yes, you can. As a human being. Oh, I'm just a sin. I'm just a human. You're a human filled with the presence of God, with the blood of Jesus to wash every sin away. It's your choice if you're not clean today. We sin. We repent. We're convicted. Repent. Guess what? I'm clean. Jesus removed it as far as these. He don't even, he remembers it no more. Doesn't mean he's got a bad memory. It means that he'll never throw that up in your face again. He'll never hold that against you again. Woo, that's the kind of father who wants to know you. Confessing your desire. There, wouldn't you say, where had my slide? I, I can't do two things at once. This, this ain't moving that, so. Lord him. Philippians 3.10, I want to know him. You need to confess that I don't know him the way I should. That's surrender. 
And you need to confess that I have a deep desire to know you, God. I really want to get to know you more. That may, may seem so simple, but that's a step. That's surrender. God, I don't know you like I should. God, I want to know you. And that's an invitation to God. Okay, I'll reveal myself to those folks. Amen? Confess. And we need to submit, surrender, and that's, everybody say humility. Humility. Psalms 34, the Lord is nigh unto them. The Lord is near those who are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. The sacrifices of the God are a broken spirit, a broken contrite heart God will not despise. Your, your level of reverence for God determines your level of intimacy. Think about that for just a minute. Your level of reverence for God will dictate your level of intimacy. You'll never get to know God more than you respect Him. Because when, you, when your respect level is low, then you, your offense to Him doesn't mean as much to you. So when you offend him, guess what? You have a broken relationship. The more you respect him, the more you can get to know him. Your reverence level will determine your level of intimacy. Another way to look at it is why do you obey God? If you obey God because, whoa, I don't want to go to jail, therefore I ain't going to steal. That's a low intimacy level. That's a low reverence level. I'm not going to do whatever to this person, whatever, because I might lose my job or whatever. What is the reason for you not sinning? If it's anything less than, I respect God Almighty. See, that's the reason. Now, the consequences, hey, there may be some good consequences. And that's true, too, I believe. If you're doing something just to, for the good of you and not for the honor of God, and you're not doing it out of respect and reverence to God, that's a low level of intimacy. There are people, good people that do good things, have no respect for God, have no reverence for God. Do you see what I'm talking about? Your reverence for God will determine the level of intimacy between you and God. And we need to seek Him. Once you've submitted, then you need to start seeking God. You will seek me and find me. We know in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13 and 14, when you search for me wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly, not three-fourths heartedly, not uh, three, four, seven-eighths seven <laughs> heartedly, not uh, fifteen-sixteenths heartedly, not 17, 30 seconds, or 31, 30 seconds, yeah. Mm. Whole. Let me say whole. You will seek me, you will find me, you will come to know me, the measure that your heart is mine. If you haven't forsaken, and you possess your heart, something else possesses your heart. As I might have told Matt or Cassidy, ah, you can't get married. You think about that a minute. Why would they want to get married if they're not going to forsake his other girlfriend? Not, I don't know if he had any. I'm just, you see what I mean? But we think we can follow God. He still has some other friends. The Bible calls it spiritual adultery. Yes, it does. We think we can two-time him. I'm here to announce to you, in case you don't already know it, you'll never get away with two-timing God. You'll never get away with two-timing your wife either or your husband. Your sin will find you out. Verse 14, Jeremiah 29, I will be found by you. 
hallelujah. You'll seek me. You'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And I will be found by you. I will let you find me. Yeah, why? Because I died for that. So that I can have a relationship with you. So that we can be in love with each other. I ask couples when we do marital counseling. Do you love him? Well, obviously. I hadn't had anybody come in yet. Well, I don't love him, but I want to marry him. <laughs> but the real question is. Are you in love? With each other. I can love Elizabeth and. Do the right things is just kind of a dutiful thing. I mean, I'm, I'm loving her. Or I can be head over heels, passionately in love with her. There's a big difference. I don't ask people anymore, do you love the Lord? I ask them, are you in love with God? Are you in love with the Lord? Do you have a passionate desire to know him and love him and serve him and never to disappoint him and then honor him in everything that you do? Woo! It goes on to say there in Jeremiah 29, I will restore your fortunes and gather you from the nations. They'd been in captivity in Babylon when he, he was writing to them. And he said, Seek me and you'll find me, and I will be found of you, and I will gather you from the nations and places where I banished you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will restore you to the place from which I deported you. I'll restore you. I'll bring you back into right relationship with me. Why? Because I love you. That's why I created you. We seek him in his word, don't we? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It can also tell you that you won't know him any more than you know his word. You can sing worship songs all day long and not know Him. I'm not against worship songs, but they'll never take the place of the Word of God. You hear me? If you let anything take the place of the Word of God, you're living on dangerous ground. I love to worship. I cry, shout. Woo! I'm known as the shouting drummer. Shouting drumming preacher. But I won't know Him. Until I devour his word. He reveals himself privately through his word. Through his word. And you'll know him to the degree that you're in the word. And the word is in you. Abide in me. And my words abide in you. That's fellowship. See? My words. Everybody say my word. Abide in you. You got to get them in you. For them to abide in you. Read it. Meditate it. Chew on it a little bit. Regurgitate it. Excuse me, that lunchtime. Man. Regurgitate it a little bit. Chew on it a little more. Mm. We're like a ruminant animal. You know what a ruminant animal is? they got four compartments to a stomach. Four stomachs just for, don't correct me, Ed. I know it's not <clears throat> altogether true, but just for the sake of the sermon, four stomachs. Now, I thought about this, and spiritually, we can digest the Word because we have the Spirit. We're not a natural man. The Bible says the natural man cannot understand the things of God, neither can he know them because the spiritual things are spiritually known or discerned. A ruminant animal like a cow can take this sorry old grass, sorry old grass, and they can eat it, and they literally... They chew on it. They swallow it. It comes back up. They chew in the cud, and they swallow it. They can get something out of this grass that other animals can't get. And you, as a Christian, can get something out of that word that other people can't get. If you chew on it, the Bible says meditate on my word. And you just literally, meditate means to roll it over. Think about it. Roll it over. You digest it. And there's, there's nutrients coming out of that word, if you will. There's life coming out of that word. Spiritually, you have the capability to get life out of what otherwise is just ink on a page. 
Why? Because you're a spiritual animal. Like a cow is a ruminant. You're a spiritual animal. Forgive me the term, but spiritual person. And you can digest and dissect and life out of the Word. Seek Him through prayer. What is prayer? Talking with God. Conversation. Communion. Communication with God. Seek Him. You'll find Him through His Word. Find Him in worship. He reveals Himself to us also in worship and in prayer. Seek you first the kingdom of God. Amen? And all these things shall be at The word seek there literally means to worship. To worship. And lastly, you're going to know God. Oh, this is almost worse than submitting. Are you ready for this? Are you sure or do you want to go home? Don't answer that. <laughs> that was not the right question, Dave. Philippians 3, 9, I want to, Philippians 3, 10, I want to know him, the power of his resurrection, and the partaking, the fellowship, the participation of his suffering. Can I tell you something today, church? You really want to know him? Really want to know him? Oh, you learn him in the mountain. You get to know him on the mountaintop. But if you really want to know him, you'll know him in the valley. In the valley of disappointment. In the valley of heartache. In the valley of loss. If you seek him, you'll find him like you'd never found him before. Suffering is a wonderful teacher. Jesus said he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Christian, suffering is not all bad. Come on. I, amen. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came to church today? Preacher said I had to suffer. Yes, I did. You don't come to Christ and everything's all rosy. You don't ever have another problem. That's a false gospel. Yes, it is. You'll never have any problems. You'll never be sick. You'll never have a... Uh -uh. It's in your need that you find your greatest revelation. You know why? We get so complacent. Now, I don't believe God puts sickness on us. We live in an evil world. And those accidents happen. The wife asked me, why did my father, why did my husband have this motorcycle like it? Robin's stepfather that's laying, doing better, but near death, or doing better now. Maybe off life support today. They took him off a little bit yesterday, breathing on his own. Her question, what did I do wrong? Man, we just live in a, there's going to be suffering. It's not if, it's when, and it's what are you going to do about it? Are you going to grow in it? Are you going to learn from it? You can grow closer to God, or you can grow bitter against God. And I believe God, the, in that suffering, we can grow so close to God that you would, you're going to know him in ways you'd never known him before. And if that's our goal, if it really is our highest priority to know God, we'll not reject suffering. Why? Because we know we're going to see a revelation. We're going to know him in ways we hadn't known him before. That's why he says, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Tough times produces close times. I was, I wasn't in the military, but I was in the cadet corps, and it was at, at really three years of tough times. One year, for sure, and very tough times. It was like a year of boot camp. And, and that's why they put you, they want you close. Because in the, you may have to sacrifice your life for this buddy right here. 
You go through some hard times together, and, and you build a camaraderie. You build a friendship. And, and I'm going to look forward. We have our 40th reunion coming up in October, and Liz and I are going down there to see some of my comrades that we suffered together with, that we cried together with, that we bled together with. And stuck together with. Boy, we have a relationship. We wouldn't have had that same relationship if we just went to school together. Mm -mm. We'd have became friends. But we have a closeness. We have an awareness. We have a friendship much more deeper than we would have had because we suffered together. I submit to you, when you suffer, like Paul says, with him, fellowship of his sufferings, the partaking of his sufferings, you'll have a deeper, sweeter relationship with him than you've ever had before. Can I hear an amen? And you'll never really know the character of a person until they do suffer. Suffer may not produce your character, but it'll absolutely reveal it. I do believe it'll produce some character in us too. We'll take those hard times and in difficult times, the trials and the tribulations and the challenges of life and, and seek God's help, we'll grow better for them. Then the Bible says it's a trial of your faith. What does trials do? We have to exercise our faith, and that's why trials are the very food of our faith. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And in this version, translation says, and is saves or rescues or redeems those that are crushed in spirit. Whew. He's near to those. He's near to those. We get so complacent sometimes. I think God enjoys us going through some difficulty. I remember letting our girls go through some difficulties. Huh? I didn't enjoy it. You didn't? Go through. No. But if you rescue your child out of every difficulty, you're preventing them from growing. You're preventing their development. We used to hatch eggs in schools all the time, or I did, and, and take an incubator in the classroom. And, boy, those students that had a see-through uh, top on it. It's real fancy. And they'd see those eggs start breaking out. First thing they'd want to do, can we help them? Randy, can we help them? Oh, they're about to come out. We want to help them. Oh, please, they can't get out. No. And we see your child suffer. And you, can we help them? Let's do that for them. Uh Uh-oh. I just prevented them from learning a lesson. Now they don't have the strength to do what they otherwise would have had because strength is developed in the struggle. When that chick tries to get out of that egg, it's exercising its wing. It's doing, uh, i got to get out. Let me out. Let me out. Let me out. Yeah, muscle. Let me out. And so when the chick gets out, it can move. You help the chick out, and it just lays there because it did not have the opportunity to struggle. Children, I mean, excuse me, parents, let your children struggle a little bit. Girls probably don't remember it. I remember saying, well, I'm just going to let them, let them struggle a little bit because they learn things. Michael's coming, so I guess my sermon's over. <laughs> what kind of son-in-law is that? <laughs> but it is. <laughs> Last point I want to make. Before he sings, complacency is the intimacy, is the enemy of intimacy. Complacency. When I'm just, we're so comfortable, and then we, we don't struggle, and we don't step out, and we don't want to be uncomfortable. And it's in those uncomfortable times, it's in those struggles, it's in those trials, it's in that faith walk that we really can grow closer to God. But if we get complacent, we get settled, and we don't move, and we become less intimate with God. Complacency is an enemy of intimacy, as is irreverence. I want to know God more. I I, I believe you do, too. Let's stand together this morning.
Jesus, I'm 